The story of Lieutenant Colonel Percy Fawcett begins in England, in London, around the turn of the century. Then as now, the Royal Geographical Society was the bastion of British exploration. Among its members, such world-famous adventurers as the African pioneer, Dr. David Livingston. In 1906, the society approached Fawcett. They needed someone to lead an expedition into the South American rainforest to establish a border between Brazil and Bolivia. Fawcett's success on the mission would earn him the society's gold medal, its highest recognition, and in 1916, induction into the Hall of Fame of British explorers. Society director, Dr. John Hemming. Well, he, he did about five expeditions. The earlier ones were, were the survey work on the Bolivian-Brazilian frontier, and that, that was straightforward surveying, and he did it very well and this society gave him a medal for that. Uh, he, but in, in the course of that, and as he grew older, he became more and more interested in this exotic and the occult. And then he started getting these ideas about imaginary uh, or legendary lost cities. Little by little, the acclaimed explorer became entranced by strange and mystical stories from the Americas. The more he researched, the more obsessed he became by these tales of Atlantis, of lost worlds and vanished cities deep in the Amazon, of untold wealth, and above all, the legendary El Dorado. His writings, still catalogued at the Royal Geographical Society, bear witness to his passion. As he prepared for his final expedition, he wrote, I have actually stood in the middle of an old city. I know where the others are. I have proved all the old records. The level-headed colonel had become an obsessive treasure hunter. And so in 1925, he set off to Brazil on what he believed would be his greatest expedition ever. He took only two companions, his 21-year-old son, Jack, and a school friend, on the search for the lost city of gold. But I don't think he mentioned El Dorado as such. He, he just, he thought he'd, he'd read a report by one of the many Bandeirante expeditions. The Bandeirantes were people from Sao Paulo who went deep into the interior of Brazil looking for gold mines or slaves. Uh, and they were at their height in the early 17th century. But the report that Fawcett came across was dated 1743, and it was a, a, a small team in the interior of the state of Bahia who were looking for some mines, gold mines, that they thought Bandeirantes had, had discovered about a hundred years earlier. And they, they, came, they wrote a report to the then Viceroy saying they'd seen this extraordinary city. Fawcett traveled to central Brazil in the province of Mato Grosso, on the edge of the Amazon basin. Starting in Cuyaba, he followed the course of the Rio Xingu, a tributary of the Amazon. According to the Bandaranti report, the lost city was 1,000 miles away, in the direction of the Atlantic. Yet Fawcett chose to go inland along the Xingu River. Why the long way round? In his readings, Fawcett had come to believe there was an entire lost empire hidden within the Amazon. He intended to discover its riches. But what began so confidently in the rooms of the Royal Geographical Society would end in tragedy. Why did Fawcett vanish? What did he discover? It's one of the great mysteries of modern exploration. And so we leave England and follow Fawcett's trail to Cuyaba. In Fawcett's day, Cuyaba was the last outpost of civilization on the edge of the wilderness. Even today, you can still see the style it possessed decades ago. Above all, 
in its magnificent churches. But in one of his last letters home, Fawcett mentioned an Indian from the jungle who had said, where I live, but some distance to travel, are buildings greater, loftier, and finer than this. They too have great doors and windows, and in the middle is a tall pillar bearing a large crystal whose light illuminates the interior and dazzles the eyes. For Fawcett, stories like this were proof that El Dorado had to exist, and that the way there was to be found through the region of the Rio Xingu. Seven decades later, we are following Fawcett's trail, following it to the point where he disappeared. But even today, the path to the Xingu River is no leisurely stroll. Any mistake could prove fatal in the wilderness. And so we pack carefully, supplies for two weeks, gifts for the Indians, outboard motors, a reserve boat, and of course, our film equipment. Osvaldo Lindemann accompanies us. Osvaldo is a mechanic, the only one on the Rio Xingu. In the remote villages of the jungle, no one is needed as often as he is, and no white man knows the area as well. Fawcett traveled light, a handful of supplies, a few horses and mules. We have exchanged the saddle for an old truck, which threatens to collapse under the weight of luggage and passengers. It took Fawcett 14 days to travel the 200 miles from Cuyaba to the Xingu River. We make the trip in one day, but the adventure remains the same. On the dusty roads, on the fringes of civilization, nothing runs smoothly. But out here, a flat tire is the smallest of problems. Subtropical temperatures soar above 100 degrees. The heat and humidity are oppressive. The Brazilian plains stretch out before us. We move forward in slow motion, breathing dust. Time here is as monotonous as the landscape we are traveling through. And suddenly, the land changes. We have arrived at the headwaters, a place where legends grow as rich as the vegetation, like the legend of Colonel Fawcett. He came from Cuyaba. The last that was heard of him was that he was with the Kalapalo Indians. He stayed there for a few days. Some of the older Kalapalos say that they took Fawcett over the river by boat. That was the last time that he and his son were seen. Then Colonel Fawcett simply disappeared in this region. The last known chapter in the life of Percy Fawcett begins here at the headwaters of the Alto Xingu. To solve the mystery of Colonel Fawcett, we must travel north to the villages of the Kalapalo Indians, a Xingu tribe. For it is in these villages that his trail evaporates. It was here that he was seen for the last time. Search parties that were sent out to look for him in the years following his disappearance all agree on this point. On the banks of the Rio Kuluene, a source river of the Xingu, our truck comes to a stop. For the next stage of our journey, we must take to the water and leave the last traces of civilization behind.
And so we enter a strange world, a world Fawcett sought, a world from which he never returned. It is a landscape lush and untamed. Behind these green walls, Fawcett believed he would locate ruined cities, temples covered in gold and jewels. This was his dream. What he found was something else entirely. We reach the first village of the Kalapalos. They are as curious about us as we are about them. Although the outside world has changed greatly over the years, here time seems to stand still. Since 1961, this area has been under government protection. The Indians here live their traditions just as they did in the days Fawcett arrived, just as they have for centuries. Once again, their bodies are painted. Their waists and foreheads are adorned with beads and parrot feathers. On their torsos, the men paint the mythology of their people. These bold slashes are the colors of the Shingu. Red for life, black for the night, yellow for the sun. The Kalapalos greet us in impressive style. In their dances, the ancient myths are relived. The story of Mabutsini, the creator god, and the people he made. For the Shingu, that history is always alive. would Percy Fawcett have made of this spectacle? He was a man obsessed, a man with no time for cultural performances. El Dorado lay ahead, and he had to keep on going. The next day, we set off again in the early morning, guided by the Calapalo, We are traveling deeper into the Shingu region, down the river to the next Kalapalo village, where Fawcett was seen for the last time. We look around with Fawcett's eyes. How did he feel on this journey? Without an outboard motor, without a local scout, even today, there are dangers along these banks. The threat of malaria, starvation, and just getting lost. But in Fawcett's day, this was unknown territory, and all the more fearsome. A river that led to an uncertain destination. A journey of strange currents, unknown tribes, wild animals. We have been traveling half a day and are still far from the next village. Quantos horas? Okay. Quantos horas? Daqui do Leonardo? Sim. 150. Sim? 5. Still five hours to go. The deeper we penetrate into the region of the Alto Xingu, the clearer it becomes that the lonely voyage of the three Englishmen was a suicide journey.
Nature is wild and merciless here. Obstacles and danger lurk all around. What Fawcett must have seen, we can only guess. What he must have felt, we'll never know. To survive here, you need experience. Did Fawcett have this experience? Did his young companions have it? Did they understand the dangers of the jungle? Could they tell poisonous snakes from harmless ones? Could they make the right decisions? Or did they fall into traps from which there was no return? The tributaries of the Shingu, a labyrinth without an exit. The art of survival is not acquired on four or five expeditions. Only those who were born here can find their way through this wilderness, can find their way past the dangers, can find food. Fawcett was dependent on the aid of the Shingu Indians, just as we are. They have skills acquired over the years. In an unforgiving wilderness, they know the way of the water. Late in the afternoon, we reach our destination at last. This Kalapalo village is the final place Fawcett was seen alive. After that, he seems to have simply vanished. All is quiet in the village. We arrive as hungry as Percy Fawcett's small expedition must have been all those years ago. We are welcomed with generosity. The hospitality of the Shingu Indians was renowned even in Fawcett's time. By the end of the 19th century, the Shingus had already aided several scientific expeditions. No doubt Fawcett knew of this reputation. He most likely counted on it. So what went wrong? We'll never know for sure what happened at the Rio Shingu all those years ago. But one thing seems certain. In dealing with a different culture, Fawcett probably made a number of gaffes Intent on the lost city, obsessed with the gold, he was not interested in the Kalapalo, not prepared for their customs, and tensions inevitably arose. He had the theory that you could travel extremely light. Well, that's all right up to a point, but he, he went with very few presents for the tribes. But the Indians do expect a visitor to bring presents. They're very generous hosts, but they expect a guest to be generous as well. So I think Fawcett arriving with, with nothing and expecting the Indians to feed him would not have been very welcome. What happened? There are many legends. Some say Fawcett left soon after, that he found El Dorado and lived out his life in jungle splendor. The only clues were discovered by later expeditions, a gold ring and a compass found near a Shingu village in 1928. Fawcett's body was never discovered, but there are many who believe his end was violent. When the Brazilian government did a, another big expedition in there in, in 1946, the Kalapalo Indians described how they had killed Fawcett. Incidentally, the, the Royal Geographic Society was associated with one of the early search expeditions for Colonel Fawcett by Commander George Dyatt in 1928, three years after he disappeared. And that went into the upper Shingu, and, and they were told that the Kalapalo had, had killed him. The Villas Boas also, who, who were on the 1946 expedition, also believed it was the Kalapalo, because the chief of the Kalapalo had told them exactly 
why and how they did it, and showed showed a skeleton that they said was the skeleton of Colonel Fawcett or his son or the son's friend, Raleigh Rimmel. The Shingu are a proud people, and Fawcett was an invader here. Those who violated the rules met with fatal consequences. Today, the so-called hookah hookah fights are a game, yet there are traces of a harsher past. <laughs> this is more than a wrestling match. It is a reenactment of the mythical first fight between the monkey and the jaguar, a fight for honor and prestige. <laughs> Kalapalo chief Kurikara is no longer interested in Fawcett's story. He would rather speak about his culture, about the body paint, the dances, the meaning of life. El Dorado, that is only the dream of the white man. So what did Fawcett find on his expedition? Did he come upon his riches, his lost city of gold? Did he ever locate his paradise in the jungle? A man in search of El Dorado, in the grip of treasure fever, would not know other treasures when he encountered them, would have no use for the quiet charms of the forest villages. For here, there are no gems, no fame, no honor. Only the same work, day in and day out. This cannot have been the dream of the ambitious Percy Fawcett. And even if he wished to stay, the Indians wouldn't have wanted him. When gold beckons, their lives are worthless. They know this, and so their lips are sealed. It's as true today as it was then. The Indians don't take the white men to the places where treasures could be. They don't talk about this, for they know that gold spells their doom. In the past, it was eccentric loners who ventured here. Today, there are others, but they still seek the same thing, according to Shingu chief Aritana. The white men don't respect the borders of the Shingu area. They invade us, chop down our trees, and above all, they search for gold. They search for gold and they poison the rivers. This is our greatest worry. There is gold throughout Brazil, and the prospectors believe it is here too, in Shingu territory, according to Ronaldo, a local official. Gold hunters have been at work here in this tributary of the Xingu. There was a prospecting ship there for years. They came and poisoned the whole river. Then as now, gold hunters meant danger for the Indians. And in an earlier time, these kinds of threats were handled just one way. They were clubbed to death. The flutes are playing in the village. They link the present to the past, to a time long ago when order was created in the world, the time of myths. Fawcett was hunting for a myth of his own, El Dorado. Yet it seems he had no feeling for what he actually encountered. We have come to the end of our journey, for it seems certain that this is where Fawcett's expedition met its end, here among the Kalapalos. Miscalculations, language barriers. These were the reasons for Fawcett's failure. Obsessed with a dream, he did not see, did not understand the beauty he had found. He paid the highest price. (laughs) 
On Fawcett's trail, we discovered not El Dorado, but a treasure that outweighs gold and silver, a fragile treasure that must be treated with the utmost care. We have discovered a heritage of mankind, the beauty of an Indian culture. We leave the village, but Fawcett's shadow lingers on. And so too does the myth of El Dorado, waiting for another treasure hunter to succumb, body and soul, to the legend of the city of gold. <laughs> 